Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining us uh, here at um, this lecture. Uh, my name is Max, I'm uh, moderating together with Julian uh, here and uh, we're joined by uh, Jyoti Pra. Uh, she's the vice chair of the CPGBML uh, from Great Britain. Um, some of you may have seen her already on the panel yesterday, so I'll keep the introduction uh, short. She's also a representative of the World Anti-Imperialist Platform and author of uh, brochures and books such as The Drive to War uh, Against Russia and China or George Orwell, Anti-Communist Propagandist, Champion of Trotskyism and State Informer. So just uh, a small selection uh, of uh, text from her. So um, since um, yeah, we want to ha still have time for a discussion afterwards, uh, I'm giving the word to uh, Jodi for her lecture. Thank you very much, comrades. Oh, is this? Yes, okay. Thank you very much, comrades. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, it was a very big topic I was asked to cover, and my hosts had many questions they wanted me to cover within that topic. So I wrote something. Uh, that was twice as long as it needed to be. And I've done my best to cut it down to the essentials. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid it will be unsatisfying in both respects that it's at the same time not detailed enough and too long. <laughs> uh, but I hope you will find it uh, at least an interesting overview of something that I think is not well enough understood or talked about in our movement and particularly because you know, we're losing the generation of people who lived a lot of these experiences. And if you don't have regular connection with people who have a living connection with some of this history, it's easy, it's easy not to realize uh, where we've come from or to have a very confused idea of where we've come from. So I've tried to piece together to the best of my ability as someone who's also not old enough to remember many of the events, uh, but I do have the a uh, privilege of working closely with, with comrades who have been active in the movement since the 60s, uh, at least. Um, so looking at the communist movement today, we see many problems. Far from being a united and a coordinated whole, uh, we see that it's characterized by disunity, disorganization, fragmentation, and ideological confusion. And comrades who are new to our movement are often surprised when they discover that the class struggle is not only going on in wider society, not only being waged between obviously hostile forces, but actually is being conducted inside every part of the working class movement and within the ranks of every communist party. You know, since the bourgeoisie is still the dominant class globally, since it has occupied that position for some time, bourgeois influence and ideology is everywhere. It affects every one of us without exception. Um, and just briefly to, 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 to remind everybody, our best protection against the harm of bourgeois ideas in our movement is to be found in regular and dedicated study of Marxism. And that's both individually and collectively. You know, collective study is very important, as well as your individual study. But daily study is also important, even if it's just a small amount every day. It's better to study a little every day than every now and again in a big chunk. And the reason I say that is because it's like a, it's like a daily inoculation against bourgeois ideology. It helps you to keep your clear class perspective and to fight the constant attack of bourgeois ideas and bourgeois pessimism and pragmatism and all the other infections that come uh, with bourgeois society and bourgeois ideology in our movement. So, you know, there have been several moments in the history of our movement when the evidence of a fierce class struggle and of the capture of large sections of our movement's leadership have become very evident. Uh, the First World War was one such clarifying moment in our movement's history. You know, many promises had been made before the war broke out by the leaders of the socialist movement across the world. And Particularly, of course, it was based in Europe at that time. The overwhelming majority of the supposedly Marxist leaders, um, as soon as the war broke out, 
They sided with their own imperialist ruling classes. They ditched their former revolutionary stances. The most important exception to this pattern of betrayal by European socialist parties in 1914 was, of course, the Bolsheviks headed by Lenin in Russia. And it was in the wake of this betrayal and in the wake of the Bolsheviks' success that our modern communist movement was founded. Out of the confusion and the treachery of 1914, there rose, like a phoenix from the ashes, the Third International, headed by the outstanding Marxist-Leninist leadership of the CPSUB in 1919. And the basis for this regrouping had been laid by the Bolsheviks and other members of what was known as the Zimmerwald Left, that part of the socialist movement which had held true to its principles throughout the course of the First World War. So Zimmerwald left came from a conference held in Zimmerwald, Switzerland in 1915. And uh, the subsequent development of Zimmerwald has a lot of resonance for where we are today. You know, this conference brought together all those who were dismayed to find uh, the turn towards militarism and imperialism by the leaders of most of their parties. Uh, in total contradiction to resolutions they'd all signed up to at a congress in Basel, also in Switzerland, just two years earlier. So the course of the war saw the firm incorporation of the right wing of the socialist movement into the bourgeois state apparatuses of Europe. Social democracy emerged as a fully fledged instrument of bourgeois influence in the working class movement. And social democratic leaders became government ministers, their parliamentarians voted for war credits, and in every way they supported and even recruited for the war effort. And those who attended the Zimmerwald conference, the first one, revealed themselves to have three tendencies. So we had on one side, a consistently revolutionary section that was headed by Lenin, which stuck firmly and consistently to the line that had previously been agreed on. In Basel, all the socialist parties had actually committed themselves that in the case of the outbreak of a war, they would work to mobilize the workers actively to oppose it, actively to oppose. And they would try to transform a war between imperialist powers in which workers were sent to slaughter fellow workers in the interests of finance capital, they would seek to transform such a war into a civil war, into a revolutionary uprising where the workers turn their guns on their own ruling classes and make a revolutionary war for socialism. That was the commitment made by the socialist parties of Europe in 1912. So in Zimmerwald, all of those who were shocked to see uh, the betrayal of these principles by the leaderships came together. And the Zimmerwald left, the firmly revolutionary section was headed by Lenin. But on the other side, there was a Zimmerwald right. They officially supported the old anti-war line, but they were afraid, fearfully afraid to be seen as splitting the movement. They wanted, to, they wanted conciliation with the open social so chauvinists. They hoped that when the, when the nasty war was over, they would be able to get back and reunite the movement. Yes? Objectively, this line was a line of capitulation to the bourgeoisie and to the bourgeois-aligned opportunists. And Lenin wrote extensively about the need to expose rather than cover over these important differences. Because these are actually the lines of the class war. And the conciliators were trying to hide and bury the lines of the class war. And the only people to suffer from that, of course, will be the workers. Lenin talked about the need to break cleanly rather than try to mend what was no longer actually whole. And then between these two, between the Zimmerwald right and the Zimmerwald left, there was a centrist position which tried to bring the two sides together. Again, reconciliation. But objectively, this section also acted like the petty bourgeois vacillators in the class struggle, unwilling, unable to take a firm position, afraid to speak out against former friends and comrades, hoping hoping against hope that they'll find a way to square this circle with the minimum of unpleasantness. Yes? History has given us all the proof we need of which position was correct. The success of Lenin and the Bolsheviks in the October Revolution was based in their firm adherence to the right line. 
their willingness to speak uncomfortable truths in order, in order to educate the workers and guide the movement. No doubt, many at the time considered Lenin to be harsh, abrupt, bad-mannered, sectarian. No doubt, many of them asked themselves and told each other, who is this upstart Russian? Why does he think he can lecture us, the German socialists, the leaders, the vanguard of the movement, about Marxism, about the correct strategy and tactics for making proletarian? Who does this guy think he is? Yes? Sound familiar? <laughs> And history, of course, we know. Not only did the Bolsheviks, guided by Lenin's brilliant scientific leadership, prove correct, not only were they successful in establishing the world's first socialist state and building the world's first socialist economy, but they inspired the development of parties of the Bolshevik type all over the world. That is why almost every country has an official communist party whose establishment dates to the years immediately following the October Revolution and the establishment of the Comintern. Many of those were splinters from what previously had been considered the official socialist movement. They were the rebels, they were the small force. They became the official force because of the weight of history what happened in the First World War and what happened in the October Revolution. This was the movement that inspired revolutionary developments all over the world and which unleashed the pent-up desire for national liberation across the colonies. For so long as the Soviet Union continued to be guided by Marxist-Leninist science, the World Communist Movement worked in harmony and garnered great prestige in every corner of the globe. And this prestige was enhanced tremendously by the victory of the communists over fascism. You know, the victory over fascism was a communist victory. And never mind the bourgeois propaganda that tells you differently. You only have to look at the true numbers involved, the true forces, where the real battles were to understand this. The victory in Europe was won by the Soviet Union at tremendous cost to itself. The victory in the East was won by China. And in both the East and the West, from Korea to Greece, from Vietnam to France, the most important supplementary forces, the partisan liberation movements against fascist occupation, were led by communists. So our present troubles also owe their origins to opportunism and have their roots in a similarly crucial moment. And that is the triumph of Khrushchevite revisionism in the Soviet Union. With the installation of Nikita Khrushchev as leader of the CPSUB after the death of Stalin in 1953, and especially at the CPSU's 20th Party Congress in 1956, the Soviet Communist Party set itself on a revisionist path from which it never returned taking actions that steadily undermined the economic mechanisms of socialist central planning, while at the same time weakening the theoretical and organizational strength of the party and its connection thereby with the masses. Leaders who did not agree with Khrushchev's market reforms and theoretical revisions were systematically purged from all important organizations of the Soviet party and the state. And at the same time, the party membership was opened up to all kinds of non-proletarian strata under the guise of building what Khrushchev called a party of the whole people. Meanwhile, the quantity and the quality of Marxist education given to party members and the wider population was downgraded. Stalin's works ceased to be produced and studied and censorship laws that had controlled the spread of bourgeois ideology were relaxed. So these were capitulations to imperialism all along the line but at the same time, Khrushchev was lulling the Soviet people to sleep by promoting idealistic utopian fantasies such as the party of the entire people, the state of the entire people. All of this fatally undermined the basis of socialism in the USSR. And in the international sphere, Khrushchevite clique did tremendous damage to the unity and the prestige of the world communist movement by promoting such anti-Marxist concepts as a peaceful transition to socialism, peaceful competition and peaceful coexistence with, so, uh, 
between socialist and imperialist states. And instead of standing up to nuclear blackmail, like we see our Korean comrades doing so brilliantly in today's world, Khrushchev echoed and reinforced it. He, like the imperialist, used the threat of a nuclear war as a justification for abandoning the positions of class struggle. And if you listen carefully today, that's exactly how the nuclear war threat is constantly used against us today. Don't fight back because the imperialists are crazy and they'll drop a bomb on you. That's how they use the, the fear of nuclear war against our movement today, to scare us into submission. In large part, Khrushchev was able to do these things because he had appropriated the leading position in the party of the great Lenin, the party of victorious revolution. And of course, it was a position that had been so brilliantly occupied by Joseph Stalin for three decades, during which time a great socialist motherland had been constructed and to whose leadership the workers and peasants of the world had learned to trust, trust implicitly, it had never let them down. The so-called secret speech made by Khrushchev at the 20th Party Congress was kept secret only from the Soviet people. The denunciations it contained against Joseph Stalin and his leadership were leaked to the imperialist press, which jubilantly published its contents all over the world. Within one year, half the world's Communist Party members had been demoralized into resigning their membership. Just think about that. A movement that looked, a few years earlier, absolutely unstoppable, suddenly, with one single blow, just a speech, demobilized half its members worldwide. Demoralized, confused, split. Before anything else had happened, just that was enough. Meanwhile, even if they did not accept every slander against Stalin and his leadership at face value, and let us remember now, comrades, that the research into the archives by our, our friend in America, Professor Grover Fur, has found the evidence that every single one of the assertions in Khrushchev's speech was a lie. And I spoke to him about when he, when he did this research, and he said to me, you know, it's a bit embarrassing, because if I could have found one or two things that were true, my research would look more balanced. Now they say I'm just a propagandist. But he said, I can only tell you what I found. He was surprised. I wasn't surprised. He was surprised. He went with an open mind to find the information, to back up, true or false, each assertion. Every single one a lie. So meanwhile, even if they didn't accept every slander against Stalin and his leadership at face value, <clears throat> and of course many communists around the world thought, this doesn't look right to me. The trust of leading communists around the world in the Soviet leadership, combined with their lack of detailed knowledge about what was happening inside the USSR, left many parties unable to recognize or resist Khrushchevite revisionism. Even the Communist Party of China, in the immediate aftermath of the publication of that speech, issued articles endorsing Khrushchev's analysis and condemning what it called Stalin's mistakes and abuses. Among other things, the Chinese party agreed with Khrushchev in condemning Stalin's emphasis of the truth that the class struggle not only continues but intensifies after the revolution. And of course, this was an absolutely correct assertion by Stalin. Some parties, especially in the imperialist countries, of course, were quiet for other reasons. You know, in the West, the Western parties, it was quite welcome to them, the Soviet turn away from class struggle. It chimed very well with the class collaborationist line in which many of them were already engaging in the post-war conditions in the imperialist countries where the construction of welfare states, the provision of a hefty social bribe even to the poorest workers uh, meant that social democracy was becoming very dominant and the communists fully collaborated in this process. In my own country, we have a dubious honor of having produced a book called The British Road to Socialism, a new program for the Communist Party in Britain. It was produced in 1951. Stalin was still alive. It's five years before Khrushchev's secret speech. 
that said, this programme said revolution was no longer necessary in the special conditions in Britain. In Britain, mark you. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. <laughs> Revolution was no longer necessary. The British working class would be able to achieve socialism gradually through bourgeois parliamentary means and through an alliance with the imperialist Labour Party. I mean, the first version of the British Road to Socialism had many correct criticisms of the dominant faction of the Labour Party, yet still it placed its hopes on alliance with what it called the mass membership of the Labour Party and a, some kind of combined action and parliamentary means. And a... Uh, it's a very confused document, but each time they've republished the British Road to Socialism, it gets more and more reformist and more and more illusions in the Labour Party. Uh, and it's, it's been, become totally embedded into the culture of that party, that the Labour Party is somehow to be used as a vehicle for achieving socialism. A party which has been, since 1900, when it was born, totally loyal and subservient to British imperialism. So... In the immediate aftermath of the 20th Party Congress in 1956, very few voices were raised against the new Soviet line. And actually, there's one notable exception that we have to mention, a very honorable exception, and it's the Greek revolutionary leader. Uh, I'm sorry if I say his name wrong. Nikolaos Zakariadis. Close enough. Although exiled to the USSR after the defeat of the Greek Revolution and wholly dependent, and think about this bravery as well, wholly dependent on Soviet hospitality, Zakariadis nevertheless bravely and repeatedly spoke out against the revisionist line now being taken by the CPSU. To silence this troublesome guest, the Soviet party used its influence to have Zakariadis removed as general secretary and then expelled from his party altogether this is the leader of the Greek Revolution, mind you. The Khrushchevites maneuvered to have him removed, expelled from his party, along with all those who were loyal to him in the leadership. And they replaced that leadership with a new leadership that was loyal to Khrushchev and his revisionist line. And this, of course, has been to the lasting detriment of the Greek working class movement. I hope I'm not speaking wrong there. Despite their initial acceptance, however, it gradually became clear to many revolutionaries around the world that they had been duped. And as this happened, the Khrushchevites used their power to force changes in the leadership of other parties that refused to follow blindly in their wake. And then, of course, in 1960, Khrushchev abruptly withdrew the thousands of Soviet technical experts who had been helping to construct Chinese industry and organize Chinese central planning. And the revolutionary wing of the Communist Party of China became aware of the great danger that threatened not only the Soviet revolution, but also their own. A terrible betrayal of socialism in the world. What an action to your fellow socialist country that's, you know, got to, got to develop quickly if it's going to survive. I mean, you know, when you're trying to build a socialist economy in conditions of imperialist dominance militarily and economically, and you're surrounded, you know, just as Stalin told the workers in the Soviet Union in the, in the 20s, so Mao was telling to the people in China, we have to industrialize fast, we have to develop fast or they will crush us. Every new socialist revolution up until this point has always faced this trouble. First, they're devastated by the war to get to become the ruling class. And then in conditions of devastation, they have to recover and develop fast if they want to survive. Very difficult. While China had the Soviet Union's backing, they had real ability to develop as they needed to and face these difficult conditions. It was a terrible betrayal of China when Khrushchev took those specialists out. The political split between the Soviet Union and China had already begun to simmer in 1959 after Khrushchev opened talks with the USA in pursuit of his policy of peaceful coexistence. So in 1960, Albania and China formed an anti-revisionist alliance and began a series of heated polemics denouncing the revisionism of the USSR. And this was the beginning of the splintering and fragmentation of the world communist movement. By 1962, the dispute between the two sides has erupted into full-fledged open hostilities that led to splits in almost all the communist parties across the capitalist world. And this rupture led to more tragedies. 
because it led to China pursuing a geopolitical line which centered around opposing the USSR as the primary goal of its geopolitical focus. China took this policy to the lengths of backing countries and movements purely on the basis of opposing anything that the Soviet Union supported. And I can't go into details here, but there's tragic consequences to that focus and that line. Mao had characterized the Soviet Union at this point as the main enemy, and even labeled the, the Soviet Union as social imperialist after the Warsaw Pact had suppressed the counter-revolution in Czechoslovakia in 1968. Now, an honorable mention here must also be made of the position of People's Korea and its leader, Comrade Kim Il-sung, because again, it was a very difficult period. Young Korea, totally devastated by decades of revolutionary war, war against occupation, Second World War, war against fascism, and then the war that was forced on it by the imperialists, the USA in particular, under the, under the UN flag, but we know 14 countries led by the USA invaded and devastated the young Korean uh, Republic. Millions of people killed, the country devastated and laid waste. Again, Korea's trying to recover, trying to rebuild. Korea needs its relationships with China and with Russia to survive in this period. Horrifically weakened by this bar barbaric war of aggression, um, Yet despite the difficulties and the dangers to Korea of, of any damage to these vital relationships, President Kim Il-sung was very principled and disciplined in his approach uh, and navigated uh, with great skill through very turbulent waters. So while never giving up his country's adherence to Marxist science and to a planned economy, while agreeing with Chairman Mao in criticizing the revisionist positions of the USSR, and thus placing Korea, uh, you would say, on the Chinese side of a theoretical divide, Kim Il-sung was not afraid also to criticize what he described as dogmatism in the Chinese position and approach. He refused to allow Korea to be sucked into this ever more damaging spiral of enmity. He further developed the Korean doctrine of juche, self-reliance, for the Korean Revolution. And while patiently overcoming difficulties in Korea's relationships with both the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, the DPRK continued to maintain respectful connections with both and refused to let the policy of either determine the fate of the Korean Revolution or set the parameters for the development of Korean socialism. And we can be very glad of the legacy that's left behind in the world today. So unfortunately, the overreaction of uh, Comrade Mao Zedong to the Khrushchevite betrayals had deadly consequences in many parts of the world. And the open hostilities between socialist countries and their proxy forces inflicted blows on our movement that the imperialists could only have dreamed of making for themselves. Of course, the imperialists weren't slow to recognize their opportunity. They worked hard to do everything they could to widen every split, to promote every disagreement, of principle and to elevate many things which were not really principles into seeming like big, big shibboleths and, and articles of faith. Um, they were definitely the provocateurs and the secret services were at work in every, every fracture they could find to make it bigger and wider and, and more uh, impassable. And even some of the brilliant tactical applications of Marxism uh, by Comrade Mao and the Chinese communists to their own particular conditions, such as uh, the waging of a people's war by establishing liberated territories, basing themselves in the downtrodden peasant masses and surrounding the cities as part of their waging of a revolutionary people's war in a semi-feudal and semi-colonized country, were made ridiculous by some of the Western uh, so-called Maoist groups. You know, we had a group in Britain, I couldn't find out or remember what their name was, but I remember hearing the stories about them, um, because they, interpreted the Chinese liberation strategy uh, like a biblical instruction handbook and responded by sending their members to live in like remote seaside towns from which they were going to one day surround the cities. Of course, 
This activity has nothing to do with building a revolutionary movement, nothing to do with connecting Marxism with the masses. All it does is make our movement look stupid and bring it into further disrepute. You know, it's, it's worthy of a life of Brian Monty Python sketch, isn't it? It's not, this is not Marxism. It's, it's provocations and silliness, and uh, I'm sure we'll one day find out there was plenty of uh, state involvement in some of these more ridiculous activities that have been carried out under the name of Maoism, Leninism, and all the other isms that the workers have been made to feel have nothing to do with them. So meanwhile, uh, his criticism of the three worlds theory uh, by Enver Hoxha drove a wedge between Albania and China in the anti-revisionist camp. Uh, and that resulted in the formation of a third Albanian-centered section of the world communist movement. Now, all three of these international groupings were guilty of errors in Marxist theory, leading to errors in their approach to geopolitics and to the fight against capitalist imperialism. But I have to say, from my perspective, and I've never seen anything to convince me otherwise, it's with the Soviet Communist Party that the culpability for this catastrophic situation primarily lies. It was the Soviet Party that began rapprochement with the imperialists. It was the Soviet Party that distorted Marx's teachings to justify retreating from revolutionary positions. It was the Soviet Party that instigated the campaign of vilification of Joseph Stalin, the great builder of socialism and defeater of fascism. It was the Soviet Party that interfered in the affairs of other parties in order to maintain hegemony over them. It was the Soviet Party that distorted the principles of internationalism, stopped helping in the vital task of developing China's socialist economy, and insisted on subservience, subservience to its line as a condition of fraternal assistance and relations. And it was the Soviet Party that preached reformism, parliamentarism, and peaceful coexistence. Besides providing plenty of opportunity to pour fuel onto the flames in various ways, the secret services of the imperialist centers now had all the ammunition they needed to give a helping hand, and I think we will find it was very substantial, to the resuscitation of Trotskyism. An imperialist-aligned, anti-Marxist ideology that had been entirely discredited by the USSR's successful building of socialism and heroic victory over fascism. Trotsky had made himself a nobody by the course of his life and the fate of all his predictions. <clears throat> nobody would have cared about him if Khrushchev hadn't resuscitated all of his lies in 1956 and handed a present to the Western imperialists. If you look at the re resurgence of Trotskyism in the West today, you'll see it comes from this, this period. They handed, the Soviets handed this gift, and we know, those of us who are old enough to have lived through the time when the Trotskyists dominated the so-called left-wing socialist movement in the imperialist countries, uh, you know what havoc that's wrought on the consciousness of the masses. With Trotsky's lies, now being repeated by the leader of the Soviet Union, and with communist parties across the world, and in the West especially, retreating from revolutionary positions, Trotsky could be presented not only as having foreseen the USSR's apparently inevitable degeneration, but as having been all along the real revolutionary. And as a result, newly founded and suspiciously well-funded Trotskyite organizations began to attract a significant following particularly amongst the radical students, teachers, and better off workers in the imperialist countries. And bourgeois historiographers trumpeting Trotsky's inheritance of Lenin's legacy uh, flourished. And of course, that, that the Trotskyist version of the history of October and the history of the Soviet Union was the one that got enshrined as official history in all our textbooks, again dating from this period. So for many, I'm, I'm going to jump forwards now, sorry. <laughs> for many revisionist parties which had sunk into social democratic reformism and all but given up any but the most token lip service to socialism, the counter-revolutions in the USSR and Europe were a death knell. Parties across the world that had remained affiliated to the revisionist USSR either dissolved themselves or changed their names and programs to embrace the new reality 
of triumphant capitalist supremacy. In my country, for example, in Britain, the old CPGB, which had already sunk into a pit of reformist Eurocommunism, dissolved itself in 1991, and as it did so, it declared in its final resolution that the October Revolution had been a mistake of historic proportions. So just remember this, comrades. When you're feeling demoralized about your size, you can be big, you can be strong. If your line is wrong, you are destined for the bin. <laughs> yes? If your line is right, you may not win. It's not guaranteed that the right line will bring you victory because many forces have to align. But if your line is wrong, you're going nowhere. No matter how big you may get for a while, you will not see socialism on the basis of a wrong line. So the result of 70 years of division and theoretical confusion in our movement that had been initiated by the Khrushchevites in the 50s has been the steady decay of revolutionary influence amongst the masses. Mass parties in many countries adopted increasingly reformist lines and were thus in no position to stand up to bourgeois triumphalism in the 1990s. Many parties that had retained the name communist, such as the parties in Italy and France, still huge at that point, but they had long ago lost any connection to revolutionary class struggle. So we found ourselves in a situation where large parties had let go of their adherence to Marxism, and the forces that had worked to keep Marxism alive were small and without a meaningful connection to the masses. Moreover, decades of misleadership and propagation of non-Marxist ideas in the name of Marxism, along with the kind of bourgeois-endorsed habit of creating a split every time there's a small disagreement, had left a culture of sectarian cult building in the place of serious party building. And what you'll find is the people who have the weakest ideology have the best discipline, so they disciplinedly stay in a party that is going nowhere, while the people who have a good understanding of Marxism uh, have, have habits of small organizations where they fracture constantly and uh, can't find the, the organizational discipline to overcome disunity and work together. So it's noticeable that where parties were able to hold on to a decent Marxist analysis, they did so by letting go of adherence to any particular local guru or international leader and by applying themselves to mastering Marxist science for themselves. In this period, this was the only route to making sense of all the competing claims and counterclaims of the plethora of groups, all claiming to uphold the true revolutionary spirit. Very difficult period in which to try to find your feet and your orientation. How, how do you work out when there's 20 Bolshevik tendencies who is telling you the truth and who is misleading you? So several initiatives were launched in the 1990s by parties and countries that remained faithful to the goal of socialist revolution. And some of these were able to make a contribution towards clarifying the problems and bringing revolutionaries together on the basis of fundamental common aims. But none was ultimately successful in healing the divides that plagued our movement for so long. I think a first important initiative uh, was the one taken by People's Korea. You know, they were standing at this point isolated and exposed. The remaining socialist countries had to face a hard new reality in which imperialist pressure greatly intensified. In all the remaining socialist countries, the USA in particular was working overtime to try to create the conditions for a similar defeat as had been suffered in Europe. Through stoking counter-revolutionary movements, as they did with Tiananmen Square in China, or through sanctions on economic blockade, as they were doubling down on in the cases of the, uh, North Korea and Cuba. And the Korean party in particular was adamant that even if it needed to make compromises in order to survive, its socialism was non-negotiable. And on the occasion of Comrade Kim Il-sung's 80th birthday in April 1992, the Workers' Party of Korea launched a declaration its official title was Let Us Defend and Advance the Cause of Socialism. Uh, it's known 
by most people as the Pyongyang Declaration. And it's still open for signatures, actually. Our party signed it quite a long time afterwards. Our party didn't exist at the time it was launched. Um, at the time it was launched, 69 parties signed it. Uh, at this point, I think there's about 300 uh, organizations which have signed. Um, and you know, you've got to look at the content. 1992, what was happening and the, and the general atmosphere. You know, the content was a positive and a very defiant endorsement of socialism at a time when so many were retreating and giving up. And the declaration outlined the beliefs of the signatories in broad and general terms. But there was no organizational uh, backup for you know, implementing or coordinating anybody's activities in the struggle against imperialism. And as a result, over the years especially, parties who really, uh, their adherence to socialism was actually pretty much lip service, were able to sign the declaration in, the, in, in following years. And you'll see, you might find in your own countries, uh, certainly in my country, you know, there are people who've signed it who I would question their real commitment uh, to the principles that are laid out there. But it's a, if you can sign it and it's a good badge, you know, there's, there's, there's conditions where people will do that. In uh, 1992, it was a bit harder. <laughs> um, and some of those parties who've signed it, you know, they don't have to prove in practice that they adhere to what they've signed, and they don't even have to publicize that they've signed it particularly. Um, but immediately following the launch of the Pyongyang, sorry, Pyongyang Declaration came the launch of the annual International Communist Seminar on May Day 1992. The Workers' Party of Belgium, at that time a revolutionary Marxist-Leninist party led by comrade Ludo Martins, had its roots in the Maoist anti-revisionist movement. But comrade Ludo had been persuaded to give up uh, the dogmatic aspects of his Maoism in favor of a broader Marxist-Leninist anti-revisionist stance. And Ludo and the PTB took the initiative of bringing together as many parties as possible from around the world, including from the territory of the former Soviet Union, in the hope of finding a path to agreement about what had caused the collapse of Soviet socialism, what the revolutionary movement needed now to do to learn and regroup and reunify. And Ludo specifically proposed trying to find a basis for the reunification of the four main tendencies then uh, inhabiting the Marxist-Leninist movement. So there was a pro-Soviet tendency, pro-Chinese, pro-Albanian, and pro-Cuban were the kind of main groupings that you would find then. Uh, and some of the prominent theoreticians besides Ludo attending the May Day seminars in Brussels uh, at that time included Hapal Brar uh, from Britain, Tamila Yabrova from Ukraine, uh, and Nina Andreeva from Russia. Uh, you may well have heard of, of some or all of those. And it was greatly to the credit of Comrade Ludo and the PTB that they made contact with so many currents within the former Soviet Union that were themselves struggling to come to terms with what had happened in their country and who continued to uphold the banner of Marxism. Unfortunately, there was no party or individual with the prestige to bring together the various warring factions and establish a common line. And this has been a recurring theme in our movement since the loss of a unified leadership. You know, these divisions abound and the impetus to overcome them has never yet been strong enough to create meaningful unity of action across international borders or to unify separate groupings within each country in the way that Lenin and the Comintern were able to do after the October Revolution. And the truth is that this is likely to continue to be the case until a new socialist revolution is successful. A socialist revolution that's led by a party guided by scientific socialism, which can restore the prestige of Marxist science in practice, inspiring the masses of the world and earning the right to be seriously listened to by Marxist and revolutionaries around the world. I know from the history of our movement in Britain how difficult it was to bring together the different parties that existed and how it was really the instrumental prestige of the Bolsheviks and the Comintern and their unity in admiring Lenin <laughs> that enabled, you know, factions that previously could not work together to come together to form the CPGB in Britain in, the, in 1920. Um, some of the major works aimed at reasserting a Marxist line during this period, uh, important books that are worth reading for everybody include Ludo Martin's book, Another View of Stalin, and some of Paul Bra's books, uh, Perestroika, 
the complete collapse of revisionism, which to my mind is still the best, I mean, I only read English, so I might be missing something very fantastic. But in English, uh, to my mind, Hapal's book, Perestroika, is the best that you'll find in explaining the roots of what happened in the Soviet Union, economic in particular. Uh, he also wrote a book, uh, Trotskyism or Leninism, uh, Social Democracy, The Enemy Within, and his book on imperialism, I think, was uh, imperialism by Hapal Bra was uh, translated into German. I know, I think in the 90s or maybe the 2000s, he did many book tours in Germany. Uh, there, were, there were members of the KPD and the DPK, or DKP, <laughs> DKP uh, who, who organized book tours for him because uh, they felt that that work was very useful. So uh, at least that one exists in German. <laughs> Uh, in 1998, the Greek Communist Party, the KKE, which had gone along with Gorbachev's catastrophic anti-socialist policies of glasnost and perestroika in the 1980s, began a process of piecing together some type of communist international. But these gatherings were named after similar events that had been hosted in the Soviet Union during the period of the development of the Sino-Soviet split uh, through the 60s, basically. Um, They've grown now and are portrayed by many of their participants as representing the official communist movement. Uh, but many problems were baked into the cake, as we say in Britain, right from the beginning of, of this refoundation, as, as it's seen. The first was that the main organizing party, the KKE, had really never fully settled accounts with its revisionist past. So some of its statements about the collapse of the USSR, in particularly some theses that were passed at its 2009 party congress, appeared to indicate a willingness to come to terms with revisionism and reverse course. But this never seems to have been reflected by a change in its organizing practices. You know, in bringing back together the uh, international movement of communist and workers' parties, international meeting, sorry, of communist and workers' parties, they really picked up where the old revisionist grouping had left off. The core of these meetings was heavily skewed from the start towards those parties that had been aligned to the revisionist Soviet Union, all of which had long ago abandoned Leninist revolutionary politics in order to remain aligned with Khrushchev and Khrushchev's successors, and none of which any longer represented the revolutionary vanguard of the masses. Most of these parties have still failed to make any meaningful evaluation of the collapse of the USSR or the opportunist course taken by themselves, the best you'll get is vague references to mistakes and a discreet silence. There's nothing to be learned from this. This is not the basis of progress for our movement. You can't get an attitude that's further from the Leninist revolutionary practice of assessing and learning from mistakes, of explaining them clearly to the masses and adjusting our activities accordingly. So just as the CPSU had been a dominating influence in the post-war gatherings it hosted, so we find that the KKE has dominated the agenda, the discussion, the participants and the outcomes of the work undertaken by the International Meeting of Communist and Workers' Parties, which is known to many by the name of its website, SolidNet. The KKE has likewise come to dominate other international organizations that also had been previously run from Moscow and which it has taken responsibility for rejuvenating. So these include the World Federation of Trade Unions, the World Federation of Democratic Youth, and the World Peace Council. You know, many parties felt a gratitude uh, to the leadership in Athens for picking up the threads of this work. But time has shown that in all these organizations that have been rekindled, they've been run on the basis of having politics that are, that are acceptable to the KKE, of being willing to go along with just being a kind of militant faction in the corner. It's like the left wing of the Labour Party. They're just there to show it's allowed, but not to influence anything. Leaders of all these supposedly international organizations are invariably protégés or personal connections of the leadership or officials of the KKE, owing gratitude and loyalty to that party, to its leaders. And over the years, you know, my party's in an interesting position uh, over the years, many friendly organizations to us have tried to persuade us that we need to be in solid net and add our weight to the kind of revolutionary wing. Um, we first applied to join in the early period after our party's formation, and since then we, re we were rejected. We reapplied many times, um, but we're consistently kept out. 
uh, our contacts aren't even contacts are not even replied to. Uh, presumably, our politics are not acceptable to solid nets gatekeepers. Nobody's told us. <laughs> they just the door is closed. Great efforts have even been made to keep our young comrades out of supposedly broad events like the World Festivals of Democratic Youth. I mean, we've had to find all sorts of ingenious ways to turn up at these events when we're excluded from the British Organising Committee and the British delegation officially. At the time of our first application to SolidNet in 2008, the International Department of the KKE asked the revisionist CPB, Communist Party of Britain, to report to them on our party's suitability. <laughs> Interesting approach, you would think, right? So the resulting assessment, which is very bizarrely commissioned from a group that must be our political enemies, right? If we weren't political enemies, why would we be separate organizations in the same country? This is a communist principle. Right? You don't set up parties for fun. <laughs> you have to have good, solid political reasons, and not small ones either. So obviously, it's a kind of weird approach to take. Of course, they're going to say we're not suitable. But anyway, the, what, what they uh, wrote was basically a, just a fabrication of lies and slanders and distortions of all kinds. It was immediately leaked to us by someone who saw it and was friendly, and we published it. We published it, and we published our reputation and answer to the various nonsense that were in it. We never had any direct contact from the KKE at this or any other time on the topic of what was in <laughs> what they said or what we said or anything else or any of our approaches. So, but you know, we've, we've, we have contact with many parties around the world and we know that there was a lot of hope felt about the prospects for SolidNet when parties with state power, like the Communist Party of China and the Workers' Party of Korea began to attend its events. Maybe now the political content's going to shift, maybe the activity is going to become more meaningful, maybe the old divisions are going to be ended and meaningful politics will start to emerge. And of course, this hope was further boosted by the admittance of a kind of a trickle of smaller parties, newer parties, with a more revolutionary program and without a history of alignment to the revisionist USSR. Sadly, however, these hopes came to nothing. Solid net gatherings remain toothless and empty affairs as far as the working out of a common platform or coordinated actions were concerned. What they did achieve was to get people used to the idea that meeting together once or twice a year presenting your conflicting papers in an atmosphere of respectful, gentlemanly disagreement, signing a joint declaration that's so broad that it essentially means nothing, and anyway is just gonna be filed on a shelf somewhere in the dust, and then retiring to the pub for a convivial drinking session, this is the height of your internationalist revolutionary work. The KKE has thus been very effective at creating a network of personal relationships that nobody wants to be seen to break. The accusation of splitting the movement is one that every delegate fears to draw onto their heads, even those who know that really there is no unity in the true sense of the word, just a polite glossing over of uncomfortable differences. Meanwhile, whatever happens in the debate, the resulting statement is the one that has been approved by the KKE and its self-reinforcing clique. Far from becoming a conduit for revolutionary ideas to spread to the opportunist wing of our movement, far from preparing an organization that's ready to rise to the challenges of the next revolutionary upsurge, SolidNet has been far more effective at calming the ardor of those forces which entered it in the hope of combating opportunism. In becoming accustomed to the norms of a bourgeois academic conference, which is essentially what, what, it's, what they're really running, many sincere comrades have come under the influence of these personal connections and by the time scales built into this activity, in which nothing ever seemed to change and the overall balance of class forces seemed to be permanently and kind of permanently stacked against us. But you know, such activity and such a view of time have nothing at all in common with the rapidly changing needs of the situation in which we now find ourselves. It's no surprise that the escalation of the war in Ukraine brought the deep fractures and inadequacies of our movement to the forefront and our differences into the cold light of day. The war 
and our movement's assessment of and response to it is the primary political question of our time. It's the pivotal point around which all other differences have become secondary. In front of our eyes, the world order is remaking itself. A new coming together of the socialist and anti-imperialist forces in the world is rapidly advancing. A cohesion in the anti-imperialist camp is developing that we haven't seen since the days when the St Stalin Soviet Union and Mao's China stood side by side at the head of the oppressed and working masses of the world. And this realignment is a, is a result of the shifting balance of class forces at the latest turn of the global crisis of overproduction. It's making itself felt in a rapidly deepening crisis economically and the accompanying desperate drive to war by the imperialist camp. In this situation, two events occurred that revealed that the days of solid net are numbered, that it remains constitutionally incapable of rising to the challenge of the new era and that it will never be a vehicle for uniting communists across borders and helping them take their place at the front and the center of this rising anti-imperialist bloc. Am I all right for time to carry on? Wave if you're getting bored. Okay. So there was an international conference hosted by the People's Democracy Party of South Korea in May last year. And at that conference, to discuss the war, and at that conference, a clear split revealed itself in the evaluation of the parties present regarding the war. And our comrades in the PDP were dismayed to find that many organizations they had considered to be fraternal were promoting bourgeois propaganda about Russian aggression being to blame for the escalation in Ukraine and Russian imperialism being the cause of what was being described as an inter-imperialist conflict. In its investigation into what could be driving these differences, the PDP discovered that so influential a party as the KKE had not only adopted this line, but had presented the international communist movement with an apparently worked out theoretical justification couched in very strong, seemingly Leninist terminology to back up what is essentially bourgeois propaganda. Such lies in the mouths of communists have the potential to do the most serious harm to our chances of unifying the masses and successfully mobilizing to defeat the imperialist war aims. So a group of like-minded organizations, including my own, which shared the PDP's dismay at this betrayal of Marxism and which understood the pivotal importance of this question right now, came together to draft the Paris Declaration and to found the World Anti-Imperialist Platform, recognizing that the essence of the coming battles is of a struggle between the allied imperialists on the one hand and the independent anti-imperialist world on the other, it is plainly the duty of communists to do everything in their power to strengthen the forces of anti-imperialism, to help in bringing the anti-imperialist bloc more firmly together, to explain the nature of struggle to the workers in our own countries, and to lay the groundwork for a defeat of the imperialist camp in every possible way, practically, organizationally, and theoretically. And then meanwhile, at its meeting in Havana, Cuba, in November last year, the split in SolidNet came into the open in a very revealing way. Instead of one declaration, two were issued about the war, statements that are diametrically opposed to one another in their content. The first one, sponsored by the KKE via a small group of Ukrainian proxies, put forward the imperialist line about Russian imperialism and aggression. The second was most significantly sponsored by two Russian communist parties that have in general had great difficulty in working together. Um, but nevertheless, on the question facing the imperialist attack, the, uh, the question of facing the imperialist attack on Russia, these two parties were united and they put forward an unequivocal resolution to that effect. And the list of signatures of the two resolutions tells you much about the state of our disunited movement, where the fracture lines are to be found. And alongside that, there were increasingly outspoken statements of dissatisfied participants, not under the KKE's control, about the undemocratic way in which leading bodies and procedures are being handled. The impotence of the organization as a whole the rottenness of the party that controls its operations are being more and more clearly revealed. And it seems unlikely 
that its meetings will continue for very much longer in their present form. I would be surprised if it can hold together in the face of all these contradictions. Like the Second International, SolidNet is destined for an ignominious burial. And those who remain affiliated to whatever is left standing when it splits will have earned their place in the annals of shame alongside such 1914 heroes of socialism as Edward Bernstein and Ramsay MacDonald. And meanwhile, those who attempt to hide and paper over the cracks of this divide should beware of finding themselves in the camp of such as Karl Kautsky, whose vacillations and attempts to find a peaceful way out of the divisions of the movement a century ago ultimately led him into the camp of those who denounced the October Revolution and worked actively to destroy it. There's a logical result to the lines we take in these battles, comrades, and we must think about those very carefully. So understanding the nature of the looming Third World War, the platform does not confine itself to working only with communists, but aims to harness all the forces in the world capable of understanding the main issue and uniting behind a broad line. At the same time, the founders and principal organizers of the platform are communists. We aim not only to strengthen the anti-imperialist struggle, but to strengthen the role of the communists within this struggle. This is vitally important for the success of the anti-imperialist movement, as well as for the success of socialism that, that is the battle to, to follow that battle. We are working hard to bring our analysis to Marxists and anti-imperialists everywhere and to persuade them to join us in this, the single most important endeavor of our era. As Marxists, we know that only Marxism provides the tools to ensure the most steadfast, most disciplined, most thorough struggle against imperialism. That real Marxist involvement and leadership of such a struggle provides its best chance of success. We must do what we can to fulfill that role in the coming period, undaunted by the size of the task and the shocking disarray in, into which our movement has been thrown. Of course, we are not starting from an ideal or an easy situation, but we are where we are and we must deal with reality as it is. There is no doubt at all that the coming struggles will see many large and long established organizations decay and fall apart, while small and relatively newer ones will grow. These changes will be determined by their ability to play the role demanded of them, by the impetus of history, and not by any inherited right to be considered as the vanguard. While it is true that the defeat of the imperialists in the coming conflicts will not be automatically and immediately uh, resulting in a worldwide victory of socialism, it should be clear that through the course of this struggle, the main impediment to socialism, capitalist imperialism, will be fatally weakened and revolutionary forces will be greatly strengthened as a result. A new wave of revolutionary upsurge is being prepared by the present crisis. National liberation struggles are already breaking out and socialist revolutions will undoubtedly follow. Wherever in the world these movements begin, we can be sure their inspiration and influence will spread rapidly, just as the influence and inspiration of October set fire to the world after 1917. Now, there's a natural pause here. I was asked to talk to you uh, something about Britain, so, and how it relates to what's happening in Germany. I'm sorry, it's hard to cover everything. So the question is, do you want to hear that, or you want to stop now and talk to me about what I've already discussed? I'll start talking and you tell me when to shut up. How's that? Just, yeah. So as with you here in Germany, our country is ruled by an established imperialist class whose subordinate position to US imperialism does not at all mean that it has ceased to be a power in its own right. We continue to stress in our analysis the power and interests of British imperialism, but it is indisputable that the war in Ukraine has highlighted the reduced position of British imperialism and revealed the fact that inter-imperialist rivalries have been subordinated to the need of all the imperialists to group together for the survival of their system. A century ago, the First World War had already greatly weakened all the individual imperialist powers that fought in it, including the victors, as well as the capitalist imperialist system as a whole. Partly this was because of the scale of destruction and devastation, but particularly it was because the First World War unleashed the power of the October Revolution. The revolution was propelled by the war and it signaled the rise of the era of socialism and national liberation. 
And not only the workers in the imperialist countries, but the oppressed ma masses across the colonies began to struggle in earnest for their emancipation from imperialist slavery from this point on. So the Second World War further weakened the old imperialist powers of Europe and Asia. In fact, it was only the existence of the USA, which was the one imperialist power that got stronger through each of the world wars instead of weaker. It's only the existence of the USA that stopped the further spread of communist revolution across Europe and Asia after 1945. In the interests of saving the capitalist system as a whole, the USA came to the rescue of the decimated imperialist European powers and helped them to somewhat of a recovery, and Japan. But while German, French, and British finance capital were assisted in maintaining a seat at the imperialist table, they were facilitated in continuing to loot the oppressed peoples and to buy social peace at home with their welfare programs. Their position was not what it had been. The USA was able to establish a system via Bretton Woods, the IMF, the World Bank, NATO, the European e Economic Community, in which none of the subordinated imperialist powers have been able to rise to dominance again. As a result, they rely for their military strength on US imperialism. And that sole fact means that ultimately, they have to subordinate their economic interests as well to those of the USA, at least for the time being. This is a source of ongoing debate between me and my dad. If anyone, <laughs> he thinks Germany is going to get out from under and maybe Britain as well at some point. They're not going to, not going to take it forever. And, uh, we, we, okay, we'll see. <laughs> this has never been clearer than in the recent months of Russia's special military operation, when the European countries were called upon to sacrifice their independent economic interests in the interests of the greater good of destroying Russia. No doubt. If Russia had been quickly defeated and dismantled as planned, if we'd had a Yugoslavia type, you know, couple of, couple of months of blitzkrieg followed by, you know, uh, unrestrained looting, the imperialists would have been satisfied that the short-term pain was worth the long-term gain. But since the Russian economy refused to buckle under the sanctions blitzkrieg, since the Russian government remained in place despite all the attempts to stir up regime change, both the economic and the military wars being raged through the proxy conflict in Ukraine are backfiring on the aggressors. Do you want me to stop? <laughs> oh, there's another five now. I like this elastic approach to time, it's good, I fear. It's not wrong, it's not wrong to point out to workers in Western Europe that they are being asked to sacrifice their access to cheap and reliable power sources, fertilizers, etc. That their inflation is being stoked, not caused, but stoked, and the industry is further degraded, further degraded, in the interests of an alien class. It's perfectly correct to take notice of this and use it to our advantage. Use to our advantage the publicity that's created when our rulers are, are divided and fighting amongst themselves. Smaller scale capital in Europe. And of course, in this case, let's remember that smaller may still comprise some pretty huge multinationals. <laughs> all relative, <laughs> is being asked to pay the price of trying to keep the profits flowing for the very biggest. Equally, there is a reason why all the European officials in the EU and NATO and so many government ministers of our countries are happy to go along with this program. This is because in Germany, as in Britain, the biggest financiers understand that their only hope of surviving this crisis is on the coattails of US imperialist power. And so ultimately, that is where their loyalty will lie. If millions of German and British workers lose their jobs or are otherwise plunged into poverty in the process, that matters little to them. They are equally indifferent to the plight of their fellow capitalists who are going to the wall. There is no honor among thieves. The capitalist system is characterized first and foremost by competition. And it is in the nature of the system that the biggest players will survive at the expense of the smaller, medium, and even what we would consider to be very big, just not big enough. In showing the, these truths to workers in our countries, our aim is not to recruit them to the cause of the capitalists who are threatened by US hegemony and wish to return to the days when they had the power to go it alone. In Britain, uh, we call this camp the Little Englanders. Uh, in Europe, you can see them in the proponents of the EU, EU army, yes? Our job is to help workers see that not only are those days gone forever, but that workers have no interest in returning to them. 
We do not want to make Britain great again by returning to the days when the British Empire ruled the waves, but to help workers understand by their own experience that there is simply no way out of crisis and war except through socialist revolution. I'm nearly there. It's noticeable that the labor aristocracy in Western Europe, which is made up of privileged workers, petty bourgeois strata, professionals, NGO workers, as well as the highly paid and professionalized trade union leaderships, is totally tied to and dependent on imperialism for its privileged position in capitalist society. It's the most loyal section of the population when it comes to defending imperialist wars and imperialist interests. In Britain, we were recently treated, as you were here in Germany, to the dis disgusting spectacle of the Trade Union Congress voting for an imperialist-backed motion to stand with Ukraine, condemning Russian aggression more strongly even than most impeccable bourgeois politicians, and practically demanding an open-ended commitment to arms and other support for NATO's proxy Ukro-Nazi army. This serves to highlight the importance of continuing to study and act on all the lessons taught to us about opportunism by Lenin. Opportunism within the working class movement remains our most deadly enemy. It represents the influence of the bourgeoisie in our midst, our enemy within, and has been the cause of many catastrophic reverses for our movement and our class. Only those who have waged serious and relentless struggles against opportunism have been successful in carrying out socialist revolutions. And there is not a doubt that this will continue to hold as true in the future as it has in the past. Thank you for your patience, comrades. Okay. okay. Oh. Sorry for that. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that uh, very interesting uh, lecture. And it's also interesting to see that uh, also in Britain you have discussions about uh, maybe the um, kind of temporarily subordinated imperialist states uh, getting out and, and confronting US imperialism or not, because that's one of the central issues that is also being discussed in the communist movement in Germany. Um, yeah, so just interesting to see that that is a point of contention for you as well. Um, Maybe I will start uh, with um, a first question and then we'll open it up for questions, but also debate. You can also debate amongst each other. It doesn't have to be always focused uh, on, the, on the, uh, our guests lecturing because we also want to further the discussion amongst ourselves, but also feel free to ask questions, of course, if you have them. Um, I would just use the chance to ask a question since, uh, since I'm here on the, on the, uh, uh, on the stage. Um, so um, maybe um, highlighting some uh, small disagreements maybe that um, uh, our organization has with, with uh, some of the things you said. Uh, we uh, recently published um, a report of the SolidNet meeting uh, in Havana, or we shouldn't say report because we weren't there, but uh, we tried to uh, give an overview of what it did, and we said that we still value it as a platform uh, of exchange, but uh, we also um, see that it's kind of lacking, that there's not enough exchange happening and not enough debate, but it's basically parties going there and just giving their positions. Uh, but uh, maybe this is uh, seen in the context of what uh, our organization has tried to do, which is part of a larger process of clarification. Uh, on a scientific basis that we try to do as in the communist movement in Germany, but also uh, internationally. And um, uh, part of that is confronting and exchanging with and talking to organizations and uh, other communists we, we disagree with and uh, trying uh, to, um, you know, work out the right line on a scientific basis. Uh, one of the slogans we uh, raised uh, was uh, with clarity to unity, so getting to a state of having not a fractured movement like we have today, uh, primarily by actually uh, solving and clarifying the questions, the central questions facing the communist movement uh, today. Uh, so I was just maybe wondering uh, how you would uh, respond to that, um, because um, from what it seemed to us that uh, a lot of the polemics-centered uh, exchange that's happening in the communist movement has not really been able to um, uh, convince a lot of other communists or organizations that uh, maybe their path was, was wrong. 
and um, yeah, maybe how we can uh, form a basis to really um, try and work on scientifically understanding the situation we're in a lot better to be able to prove to other organizations and communists that do want to know uh, that uh, this is the right line to take and not this. Maybe you could uh, respond with your thoughts. Yeah. I'm sure others in the audience will have views on this. <coughs> There's two aspects uh, to what you're talking about. The desire to talk to as wide a range of people as possible in order to inform your process of thinking and clarification and decision making is an excellent one. But it, there's two important qualifications for that. Number one, it's not an open-ended forever process, right? It has an aim in mind. And the, you have a, the idea is to get, gather as much information so you can come to a conclusion, make a policy and go forwards, yes? So that's number one. You have a, an aim and a time scale involved. Number two, there's the honest intention to look for the correct line and not to feed your ego or your organizational aims. Yes? And these are two very important principles because the, the purpose is to find the truth so that you can form a correct policy and go forwards. Now, of course, you can't be doing that process forever or there will be no going forwards. There will be no action. There will be permanent indecision. There must be a time scale. And you must also be prepared to keep doing it as you go forward, right? A period of, a period of preparing to go forward cannot be a permanent period. Uh, at certain point, you must do the best you can with what you have, start going forwards, and keep reassessing as you go, right? That's also something we do. In communism, we're a bit like uh, anyone here involved in software development. They have a, an approach that they call agile software development, right? You, you build something that's good enough, yes? And you go forwards and you, and you use it and you iterate, yes? Perfect it, make it better as it comes into contact with reality <laughs> and things are exposed. You don't sit there and wait and build the perfect machine for 20 years and then press go and a little bit of code that was in the middle that wasn't quite right makes the whole thing fall over. And you, didn't, you, never, you couldn't have really discovered that until you pressed go. Right? So we are iterative developers, if you like. We have to also work in practice, see how our ideas are holding up to the crucible of struggle. And, you know, class struggle is, uh, unfortunately, there's not a formula. It is a science. It's based on deep theoretical scientific understanding of the laws of the development of history, the laws of uh, the development of capital. But there's no formula for how every single event is going to unfold in history. It's like we can understand the law of motion of matter, but at the same time, we can't predict the direction every quark is going to take, right? There's a lot of, you, you have to learn to recognize that there are so many things interacting that you have to learn to feel that there's also an art. And part of the art of revolution comes from experience combined with theoretical knowledge, where you start to get a sense of how these movements fit together. Um, so one has to be prepared to also just plunge in <laughs> and start and move and see what happens. Uh, but with always an open mind, an honest mind, and a constantly developing mind, open to what's around you, open to new information, also constantly studying the classics which keep our perspective firmly rooted in scientific realities. The problem with SolidNet is it has neither of these things. Just coming together and everybody saying, I'm a communist, I'm a communist too, although we have completely opposite ideas of what that means. And we tell each other the things we think and we go, yeah, yeah, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? And go home again. But we've made a personal, friendly connection. I don't see anything useful in that. And you could say it's sour grapes, they don't let me in. Maybe if, maybe if I was going off to Havana every couple of years, I'd feel differently. Um, but genuinely, politically, when I look at that, I don't see in it anything that's useful to the development of our movement, quite the reverse, and I've outlined my reasons for that. You know, I've given you a very broad outline, but this uh, exchange is only exchange and not just, you know, there's two types of conversation, aren't there? There's the one where you genuinely open your mind to the ideas of the person who's talking to you, or there's the one where you wait for your turn to speak. 
And you're just thinking about what you're going to say and you're waiting. And uh, when, when is this guy going to shut up so I can say my thing? And you, you just talk at each other. As human beings, we know the difference, right? And as communists, there's also a great difference between an exchange where people come and say opposing things to each other and go away and nothing changes, and an exchange where people genuinely feel that the people they're talking to have something that they need to listen to. And part of that also comes from whether the people who are delivering these lines genuinely, scientifically, sincerely believe in them as the road to revolution, or whether they've just learned a culture of repeating lines they learned by heart. Are the people who are pronouncing these opinions really grounded in science when they deliver them? Do they really know what they're talking about? Do they sincerely believe that they have worked out for their own country a program, a path, a step, the next step towards revolution? Do they even believe that the socialist revolution is ever going to happen? Because in my country, most of the people who call themselves socialist and communist, if you scratch at them a little bit, they don't believe there's going to be a socialist revolution in Britain. They certainly haven't worked out what's the next step they need to be taking. It's not guiding their work. They have a habit of activity, a culture of being, where they repeat phrases like a, a rote. But this is not revolution. And because someone says I'm a communist and spouts phrases that have the word Lenin or Marx or whatever in them, you, know, you have to also educate yourself so you're able to appraise for yourself critically the content, not only of the phrases and the words, but of the activity of the organizations that put forward the phrases and the words. How do the two match up? What's the result of their actions? What's their impact on the movement at home and abroad? You know, in reality, what is it that those actions tend towards in terms of class struggle? I don't know if that helped. All right, uh, so we're going to open it up for questions, but also statements. Feel free to discuss among each other as well, as I said. Uh, yeah, you're first behind, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know. and uh, I think, yeah, we'll just decide as we go along, I would say, because it's not all maybe focused on, no, 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 on Jyoti. Okay. Um, my name is Saithor, and I'm visiting from Iceland, and I had a question. Um, so I'm on the board of the Working Class Union, and we went on strike earlier this year uh, to get a historic raise for the second time in a row. And um, we have, you know, coming here, I've, I've learned so much, but I approached uh, communism and all of these theories um, kind of as a beginner. I've, I hear a lot of names and books and theories that I've never heard before, and I appreciate being educated about them and I uh, each time a concept is uh, labeled I can recognize a real-life event that is a perfect reflection of this it's why I find this so useful but my question is that why does it feel like visiting two such distinct spaces when I'm in the working class and uh, speaking with them and organizing a strike or talking about why they're being exploited by their boss. Uh, this feels like one distinct space. And then when I discuss a theory or learn about history, um, it feels like a different space. Even though for me, visiting between the two, they seem like they should be completely together because we are using all of the principles of communism and class organization to gain raises and to defeat the capitalists, but um, we, yeah, I, I'm just curious why they feel so different when it really feels like they're one and the same uh, and shouldn't feel so different. That was a question for Jyoti or for the audience? For, for anyone who All has right. an answer that would help me. Comrade in the pink shirt here who raised his hand. I'm sure there'll be lots of people. Hello, my name is Daniel. I came from Spain. I want to make you to brief questions. First, can you span us the Sino-Soviet relations during its periods? How was the relation between China and the USSR? And the second, do you have any commentary 
about uh, members of the Spanish Communist Party in, in the government of the Social Democrats and the presence of the well, Vice President and Labour Minister and many more on the government. And uh, for the first question, especially in relation with Korea and uh, Vietnam also. Mm. Sorry, <laughs> so is Lappi. Comrade Patelis. Uh, I want to thank you, all of you, and especially Comrade Jyoti for such an important speech. I agree with uh, every, uh, with all your main positions, but let me a little uh, to add some problematics uh, in the content of your speech. Uh, for example, uh, if you will try to find out the argumentation of the nowadays opportunistic leadership of Communist Party of Greece, you will find out uh, such phrases as, for example, beginning from the 50s, after Stalin's death, we had an opportunistic shift in uh, Soviet Union, in the Communist Party of Soviet Union, and all over the world. And uh, more of that, they are beginning to blame that period Soviet government and uh, Communist Party of Soviet Union that they used to uh, involve bourgeois instruments and approaches, including firstly the uh, commodity money relationships. So they uh, began to destroy socialism uh, beginning from that period and they are beginning to prepare their people that uh, the significant date is not Stalin's death, but even Stalin is not a real revolutionary because he's talking about commodity and money relations in Soviet economy. He's talking about the uh, value law in Soviet economy, etc. So he's not so communistic also, Stalin, you see? Uh, why I'm talking about that? Uh, I'm talking about that because, uh, unfortunately, um, maybe I'm wrong, but I have the opinion that uh, Lenin was the last leader of revolutionary movement who's able to, co to uh, to keep together theoretical, scientific approach at the highest level, together with practical organizing revolutionary work. After Lenin, we had, of course, very great leaders, such as Stalin, Mao, Kim, uh, Ho Chi Minh, Castro, etc. But they couldn't have a synthesis of those abilities, of those skills, of the real leader. And beginning from that period, I mean beginning from uh, after uh, the Soviet Revolution, after the October Revolution, we had a line uh, where the main line of the communist parties, including, unfortunately, including Communist Party of Soviet Union, they began to move out of the strategy line founded by Marx and Engels and Lenin to keep the scientific research at such a level according to which we can define the concrete historical dialectics of tactics and strategy the dialectic relations between, between strategy and tactics in a real program. And they become to accept 
a position which was fixed in several documents in several parties, beginning from the Communist Party of Soviet Union, that uh, theory is just generalizing the practice experience. Excuse me, but that position has nothing to do with Marxism. This is a so-called Marxist variation of pragmatism. Following the practice means method of trial and error. Method of trial and error is a common method between animals and humans in a very low stage. Believe me, after the Marxism, we have to describe, to explain, and predict the role of real revolutionary science is to predict and to open the directions for the lines of communists. After that historic situation, I am afraid that we had the opposite way. We are at the beginning defining our everyday right line, the only right line. And afterward, we are trying to find out in a pragmatic way, so-called theory or ideology or propaganda ideologies, schemes and dogmas to show something like scientific or Marxist. I, I, of course, I am I'm making that uh, too hard to be clear, okay? Of course, this is not uh, such rude in, in every party, in any time, but this is a tendency which is the dominant tendency in the history of the communist parties. And believe me, this is not just a symptom, it's the essential characteristic of the destroying the third international tradition. I insist on that, destroying the third international tradition. So, if we are not able nowadays to find out not just a chronological date of beginning of the opportunistic split related with the date of the death of one or another leader, because it is something mystic, you know, uh, we have uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our country, I suppose not only in my country, we have uh, uh, comrades, uh, they think they are communists, and they say that the day uh, when Stalin died, we had socialism. The next day after Stalin died, we had capitalism in Soviet Union. Magic. Magic. How magic? Okay? And uh, tell me please, are you sure that all the arguments and all the discussions, great discussions between communist parties and great leaders, including Mao, Stalin, Khrushchev, uh, he's not great, of course, uh, Kim, uh, Hoja, even our historical heroic leader, Zachariadis, he was talking about. Are you sure that all that arguments were on the solid scientific basis or something else? For example, I have a line. I think that this is the right line. I have the real um, plan for building socialism. You have another line. My line is the best. You're opportunist. Excuse me, but Built-in socialism, including, for example, the role of central scientific planning of strategic directions of economy, including the subordinated role of commodity money relations in that process. Is that a subject of what I like or you don't like? Is that a subject of subjective idealism and voluntarism? Of course, the, the, the question is rhetoric, but we can't continue 
in the third decade of 21st century to discuss such problems in that way. Simply, we can't. We can't persuade young people that we have a positive communist perspective without learning critically, for example, which is the main contradiction of early socialism and of every socialist building. Why I'm asking? Because when I was uh, 22, 23 years old and I began to, to talk about contradictions of uh, socialism, my comrades say, told me that I am crazy or I'm a traitor or, or some, I'm something not Marxist, I'm not communist. Why? Because I was trying to investigate to research contradictions in social building. I, I was trying to explain that without contradictions, we have no dialectics, no development. But it was not useful for them. They couldn't understand that. We are continuing to say the same today in several words, in several approaches. So uh, I'm concluding with that. We have to develop theory in similar way, not in the same, not in the same. The situations are never the same. The situation is, is not the situation of 1940 because I like it. The situation is definitely another situation, unique situation. So we have to develop fundamentally all the directions of our revolutionary science, revolutionary theory, and without such development, we can't win. Otherwise, we'll continue to discuss in a spiritualistic, idealistic way who has the best criteria or aesthetics on identifying identities. Because lines without science, excuse me, but it's very similar to postmodernity identities. Thank you. Okay, just one thing. We have a lot of people wanting to say something, so maybe we can keep it to two to three minutes. Uh, the la person standing in the back. Okay, so my question is much easier on the theoretical side, but I think it's much harder on being an, an, uh, a human being with integrity. And I wanted to use this opportunity to ask someone who's a little bit older and a little bit more experienced. Um, I have a question where I am split in two as well. Um, how to, uh, to handle politics or action in one's own country in contrast to international politics and the struggle for international so socialism and basically how to emotionally integrate it without being completely in desperation, which is something that is very hard for me. I know anger is a very constructive emotion sometimes, but it's hard, especially in Germany. It's very, very hard for me. <laughs> Satya? Um, yeah, uh, a very uh, provocative and a very uh, relevant uh, discussion uh, here right now. And Jodi, thanks a lot for this uh, this historical development of the communist movement. It, uh, it gives me a very good perspective to understand uh, the developments of the communist movement. And I think CPIM, for example, in India really epitomizes this contradictory development of the communist movement. It has problems and it has its ideological strengths also. And maybe sometime I would like to talk to you about that. Just two uh, small questions, one to you. You mentioned that uh, the communists or the communists who do not have a correct line or do, who do not have the sincerity of understanding Marxism, Leninism, they are good at holding on to the formal side of uh, the organizational discipline. And on the other hand, who are sincere in finding that out, they keep on splitting. Why is that? Uh, and uh, to Patelis, can you explain once again uh, what was the tradition of the Third International which was destroyed? Uh, and how was it destroyed? I could not fully understand that. Maybe the second question you can 
uh, communicate together after the talk because we have so many people raising their hands. Um, Tini was the next one. That's a lunch chat. Thank you very much for um, your speech, Jody. I wanted to ask you, um, you have talked a lot about SolidNet and what is WAP? So is it the answer, the anti-SolidNet platform? Or um, how, what, what are you aiming for? I didn't really get that. Maybe I was missing it, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe you could answer some questions of who's getting in there, how you're selecting them, and how your interf interaction is, and everything. Yeah, and the, and the main aim. I'm worried to take too much time and then the people on the floor. So let everybody speak and say what they want to do and then I'll, okay. I'll sum up as much as I can at the end maybe that's best comrade next to Tini if you let me go I'll take all the heads <laughs> Uh, I have one comment to Comrade Saitor. You said uh, you are told many books recommendation you got, right? If against your question, you are recommended a book, so this person does not understand it. <laughs> okay, that was just a comment. And uh, second, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, regarding the international communist movement. Do you think that uh, the trade unions or the communists in the north, by enforcing the degrowth in the north, can help better the comrades and uh, workers in the south? So that's one question. Second question is, uh, recently we have seen the split in the left due to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And do you also say that a similar phenomena could occur when China and India come in conflict? Because there is also a ticking bomb. And the last year we saw that the both countries came closer to war and or uh, hard conflict. Thank you very much. Jasper? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for this interesting uh, talk. Um, I want to pick up um, some uh, points that uh, Dimitris Patelis made. So I think when we talk about the, um, the Khrushchev uh, revisionism, then um, of course this was a great overview you gave, but uh, we have to um, look at it in a, in a Marxist um, um, uh, uh, way, and, and this includes to look at the uh, economic relations and the economic uh, uh, developments in, in, in the Soviet Union and in the world in this time. And I think yesterday um, in the workshop of Patelis we had a um, nice point. Um, we had a um, in the 60s, 70s, we had this new development of this new imperialism where we had such a um, kind of, um, um, of, of so socialization of, of the means of production um, that uh, is uh, from bourgeois described as globalization um, that, that was necessary to produce the most advanced uh, technologies. So um, we had a situation where the West was developing, developing the most advanced te technologies and uh, um, uh, in a working division over the whole whole planet, right? And at the same time, the Soviet Union um, barely organized this kind of uh, um, working division um, over its uh, social over the socialist camp, right? And the DDR, for example, um, had great problems developing developing the the most advanced technologies by its own, but it had to. Um, they had to 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 um, uh, to get a huge amount of, of of dollars to buy advanced machines from from uh, the Japanese, and uh, this led to problems in the DDR itself. So all these developments have to be taken into account. And when we understand the the mistakes, then we can take about the the the. the uh, things that are developing in China right now, and they took a different path. They um, made themselves uh, part of the 
globalization, um, try to, con to control it, and um, obviously are on a different path uh, and might succeed. So I think this is a very um, important point. And um, of course, uh, to understand all these, th all, all these things on a very fundamental um, basis, uh, we need a very, very developed um, uh, kind of scientific uh, work in, in our roles. And this um, comes, uh, leads me to my next point. Um, how do we organize this work? I mean, so we, we need to get in touch with the working class. We need to be in the everyday struggle of the working class. On the same time, we need to be the, the scientists that understand how the world works. And this is, this is uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of work to do, yeah? So the only way to, to organize this is to build up a very, very <laughs> good working communist party that is able to organize <clears throat> all these things uh, in parallel and in the, in the quality that, that we need, right? So my question is, uh, how, is how are these international struggles that you're um, really into now and that you're um, supporting right now developed and linked to the, to the build-up of the Communist Party that you need in Great Britain? <coughs> Lenny? Um. <coughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I can agree with a lot what you said uh, about the anti-imperialist struggle, um, but I guess uh, with it, it, there come open questions and uh, how this struggle, uh, how we can fight the struggle against imperialism. And we have to um, talk about this, we have to discuss uh, open questions and um, um, disagreements that we have on, on uh, the fight against uh, anti-imperialism that come up and I wanted to ask you whether um, the WAP um, it is uh, stressed that uh, we that is a platform of the common fight of the common fight against imperialism and I uh, value that uh, very high but uh, still um, how does the uh, WAP um, uh, do this discussion. Do you have a, a broad discussion? And maybe you could give just uh, some examples of um, what you discuss in the WAP. Um, what are current uh, hot topics uh, in the fight uh, against imperialism? Um, I would so I would be interested um, in that as well. Because um, you seem really uh, united, and um, uh, that's good. That's very good. But uh, I also want to hear about your discussions uh, that you have. Yeah. Okay, we can take one more, and then I would give Jyoti the word again for answering and closing remarks. Can all of the people put their hands up that want now? Okay, the comrade in the checkered uh, shirt. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciated the discussion of the repercussions for Khrushchevism in the Soviet Union. Uh, but I couldn't help wonder whether all these same critiques apply even more profoundly to the capitalist rotors in China and the course they've taken. Uh, beyond even peaceful coexistence, peaceful codependence uh, with the imperialist uh, and opportunistic foreign policy, which can no longer be uh, reactive anti-Sovietism. Uh, and when we consider this balance of forces in the world, uh, the capitalist rotors and their followers in China, in uh, Soviet, the former Soviet Union, uh, the ruling class there are precisely those who dismantled, plundered socialism, uh, and have maintained power mainly by uh, exploiting those populations and making that uh, wealth flow back to the West. Um, and I, I thought about, there's a comment by Samir Min, he said that the Comprador bourgeoisie and the national bourgeoisie are not two different classes, but two tendencies within the same class. And that hangs on the uh, balance of forces within and without a country. It seems to me when we think about the national bourgeoisie now, we're imagining the kind of national bourgeoisie uh, that was possible in the balance of forces that existed during the Cold War. Uh, but when there's no longer this uh, socialist camp to create these material conditions for uh, the kind of national bourgeoisie that we would potentially form alliances in the anti-imperialist struggle uh, previously, 
is this something we need to take into consideration? Because uh, I appreciated Jody's comment yesterday uh, that there's this fantasy, I think, common in Germany uh, of a national bourgeoisie here in Germany even that we could hang on and to put our hopes in them. Uh, but is there also a risk maybe that we put too much hope in the national bourgeoisie or a fantasy about a national bourgeoisie that might be more progressive uh, outside the core lands than really is the case? Thank you. Okay, thanks for the discussion. I think excellent uh, questions and uh, yeah, just statements given. So you have the last words. Wow. <laughs> I mean, just as a, by way of an apology for all the shortcomings, not only in my talk, but in my answers to all of these very interesting and important questions. You know, my talk, I told you it was gonna be unsatisfactory, right? Because at the same time, it's too long and it's too short. Because in trying to give you an overview and a summary, I've of course generalized and glossed over all kinds of important questions and summed up things which take books and books into half a sentence. And that is, that's the essence of what I do. If anybody ever says to you, who the flip is this Jody bro? <laughs> what does she know? What does she do? I know nothing. Uh, what do I do? I try to synthesize and bring together to give people a broad overview of a topic. I'm not an academic, I'm not a deep researcher. I try to study Marxism, understand our movement. I'm an active communist, um, as well as a, a, a student of Marxism-Leninism. But I'm someone who has a long experience in the movement and comes from a tradition of people who have given their lives to study and activity simultaneously and through this period. So I am someone who's in a quite a good position through my daily work as well as my experience and my connections to try to give broad synthesis. And I am aware <laughs> that that leaves many holes for discussion and things, you missed out this and you didn't say this, and of course that is all true. There's many weaknesses to this, but I hope in giving a broad overview, you start to get some context for the questions because it's very easy to delve deeply into one particular aspect of one particular moment in time and get so caught in the details and everything about that that you lose the big picture. And that's what I say to anybody who feels pessimistic, for example, you know, the current, the lady over here. I know what you're talking about, the pessimism, the overwhelm, the class forces are so stacked against us, the working class doesn't know that it needs us. They think we're lunatics on the fringe. They don't know that we represent the global masses. They think we're the fringe activity. And, uh, you know, they're so saturated in bourgeois ideology and they're so surrounded by the bourgeois bubble. They don't realize, that they're starting to feel cynical that they're lied to. They don't realize how much they're lied to. They don't realize how distorted and confused and inhuman is the world that they occupy. And they think we, the majority, are a fringe weirdo minority. That's not gonna last forever. But it can be overwhelming sometimes if you're surrounded by bourgeois ideology. That's why I talk about the need to study. And when I say study, I don't mean read. I mean study the classics on a daily basis. Of course, read widely. But first of all, study and master the classics and always, always, every day, give a portion of your attention to Marx, Engels, Lenin in particular. Because it's from these deep scientific thinkers that you will rejuvenate and reinforce your ability to take a broad view. Marx and Engels started their young lives at a revolutionary time. They had a revolutionary perspective. They had that youthful communist ardor where they see the developments of history in such an optimistic way all the time. They didn't live to see the fruition of their work at all, but they saw it was coming. They never lost faith in that because of their deep scientific understanding. And if you want to overcome pessimism, study Marxism properly. Not people who say they're Marxists, not people who will describe to you the symptoms of Marxism, which of course all this is interesting and useful to have data at your fingertips about how imperialism oppresses people and loots people is good and useful. But to understand the broad picture, you need Marx, Engels or Lenin every day <laughs> to just keep your perspective and your optimism and your understanding of why you're on the right side of history alive. And then no amount of pessimistic activity around you will, can, can, can undermine that, that knowledge. Because not a faith it can feel like what it's like. It's, it's knowledge. And that's why, you know, once you've really understood Marxism, you, you become like a, you have steel 
inside you. You know, Stalin was well named. He was a brilliant Marxist Leninist, and that made him a man of steel. You know, and every communist has the potential to be a person of steel. <laughs> no, that's a man of art. Oh, I feel like I'm a man of steel. You know, there's something inside my core that won't be broken by any treatment or, you know, uh, sidelining or, you know, propaganda attacks or whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, we understand where history is going and we're on the right side of that. Um, you know, somebody asked about prioritizing our tasks. Very hard when you're small and there's so much to be done. How do you know what to do? Well, again, there's not a formula, but um, you do, of course, have to be realistic with yourselves, depending on the size of your forces. Some of the things we can see we would like to do may well have to wait till after the revolution. You know, <laughs> everything is not possible. Everything is not possible, so we must learn to prioritize. Look at what's the most important. Look at how big our forces is. Look at who those forces, not just numbers. Who is it we've got? What's their level of experience? What's their capabilities? What time do they have available? There's so many factors, you know, in working out what you are able to do at any one time. While we're small, mastering Marxism and working out how to popularize it, how to express it and connect it to activities uh, that will resonate with working people, how to write a leaflet that gives a socialist perspective on a struggle in a factory or a Palestine liberation uh, movement or a struggle against privatization of hospitals, you know? How to talk to somebody in the street when you have a stall that's selling literature and papers. How to listen to people who come to talk to you so that you can work out where they're at and give them one thing to think about that might take them a little tiny step further forwards. You know, these are small everyday skills of a Marxist organization and individuals. Uh, when it comes to international work, you know, our party in its early days did a lot of international work because we had many international connections before we were a party. And then at a certain point in our development, we sort of made a deliberate turn away from that. We don't have many resources. We don't have many people. We said, well, we've got to focus our resources on trying to build our branches and a viable organization in Britain. But you know, the present situation in the world has made a decision for us. We found we were in a position to make a contribution at an international level that's needed at a time when it's needed. So we had to forget about the money and the people and the extra load on people who already have too much to do and just find a way because you know, life put that task in front of us. It wasn't in our roadmap. <laughs> it wasn't in our plan of how we're going to build our party. But one also has to be prepared to respond to events and reassess and reevaluate. So, you know, there, there is an element of um, responding to life and seeing what happens in our work alongside our general theoretical overview. And we have to always be balancing the two, looking at what's happening right now and working out how you respond to that whilst bearing in mind your longer-term goals and, and what resources you have and all the rest of it, you know. So there, I'm afraid there's no easy answer to these questions. Um, but learning to see the, the fundamental, the primary, and let go of all the, 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 the wish list and the nice-to-haves or allow them to be secondary, you know, prioritizing um, your activities is, is very important. Uh, and it's the only way you're going to maintain your sanity as well. <laughs> Um, what is the platform? No, we're not the anti-solid net. We were not formed in opposition to anybody. We were formed in response to a need that was not being met. That's a different thing. Have we found ourselves, as a result of our formation, attacked? Yes. <laughs> With good reason. We threaten a control of communist forces which keeps them paralyzed. Do we want to threaten that? Of course we do. We didn't found ourselves to oppose SolidNet, but of course that's how it's ended up. Because what we founded ourselves to do is practically reinforce the growth, development, and hopefully contribute to the victory of the anti-imperialist camp at a crucial period. When this is, the, this is the fight of all fights, friends. We've been waiting all this time for revolutionary situations and they're starting to develop right in front of us 
And everyone's sitting on their chair going, oh, look the other way. Not quite ready. Oh, this is a war between imperialists, nothing to do with us. No. <laughs> no. Look around. This is urgent now. And this, word, this question has to be responded to. It wasn't being responded to. And this old way of turning up to conferences and delivering papers that say opposite things and going home again. And nothing changes. And we come back and do the same thing in a year's time and again in another year's time. And meanwhile, the real activity is happening in the world. And the communists are sat in the corner having professional debates or sorry, academic debates once a year. Is this what Marxist science teaches us? Is this why there's 95 volumes by Marx, Engels, and Lenin on the walls of my room so I can point to them and say I'm a Marxist? What's in the bloody books? Pardon my French. Yes? Actually, it's probably more German, isn't it? There you go. <laughs> we swear in German in England. Um, how do we find people? Well, we look for people who look like they want to do something, and they find us also. <laughs> we wrote the Paris Declaration to embody and summarize what we see as the primary division in the world today. We hope it speaks for itself. That's the, that's the primary basis on which we ask people to come towards us. Does this agree with your idea of what's happening in the world today? On this basis, are you prepared to unite with us in joint action to bolster the forces of anti-imperialism? Will you take this program to the masses in your country? Yes? Not come here and sign a piece of paper and go home and come and see us at the next conference. Is this a line, is this a banner that you are prepared to take to the streets in your country to help educate the workers where you live about what's happening in the world? All of us, we're a very small party in Britain. We have minimal connection to the working class right now. But we do what we can to grow that on the basis of telling them the truths they need to hear. We have made a leaflet of the Paris Declaration explaining where it came from and why we support it. And we put it on all our stalls. When we have a stall, we also put up a platform banner. We try to connect this analysis with people that we meet. Show it to them, talk to them. A leaflet you can give for nothing to anybody who talks to you. We take it to anti-war meetings, along with people who'll stand up from the floor and say this, our anti-war movement, this first demand of the so-called peacemakers is Russian troops out. And the only people who are gonna tell the, the well-meaning souls who turn up to those meetings that Russian troops out means NATO forces in, means Nazis in, means Donbass massacre in, the only people who will tell the peace lovers of Britain, these hard truths are us. So we take our platform leaflet and we take our people into their meetings and we intervene and we try in whatever way we can to connect these difficult truths with the workers of Britain in whatever way we can. And we know that life is going to prove us correct. Remember when you're feeling overwhelmed. Number one, you're with the global majority. Number two, the forces of history are bolstering us every day. Our momentum is growing. The momentum of the other side is causing decay, demoralization, fracturing, and falling apart. And if you want to see a proof of how these forces develop unseen and then burst out, only look at Palestine right now. Is that enough? I'm sorry I can't answer more questions. I think we're out of time. Right. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it here because we're already uh, seven minutes over the time. But it was extremely interesting, so we thought it was worth it. Uh, please give a warm round of applause to Joe team. <laughs>